Good morning. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship on this 15th Sunday of Ordinary Time in this church year. We are glad to be together and I'm glad to have my daughter Sharice and grandson Carter with me today. So uh, if you haven't met them, be sure you do so before you leave. Do what you can to embarrass them and uh, uh, give them lots of attention. Let's, speaking of attention, let's notice the announcements in our worship folder. Men, remember the North Alabama uh, Presbyterian... Pres Actually, that's too many. The North Alabama Presbyter Presbyter Presbytery, Presbyterian men... Try saying that six times fast, all right? We'll meet next Monday, a week from tomorrow. Uh, reservations need to be made, I think, Thursday of this week. If you plan to attend... Please let me know. Uh, Christy Ashton will be speaking, our uh, stated clerk of the session and pastor at Hope Presbyterian Church in Huntsville. Um, uh, Angie was singing, Angie Austin was singing Christy's praises last week, so I know it will be a good message. If you are able to attend, let me know that you plan to do that. Remember, our mission of the month is the Presbyterian Children's Home. Uh, if you wish to make an extra donation to the children's home, simply put a check in the offering plate and put children on it. Session members, remember we are not meeting this month. We will meet the second Sunday in August. If you have not been in the fellowship hall, uh, if you were there for Sunday school class, you know, we now have shutters on the windows over there, beautiful shutters. A donation from someone in the uh, congregation and we're appreciative of that and be sure to go over and take a look if you have not seen those now uh, Robert Austin wants to give us a report on the recent St. Jude fundraiser the St. Jude chaplaincy program is one of our regular missions here at Old Brick Robert you're on uh, we have uh, the and, and, uh, all the uh, it was a great success. Um, made a lot of money. I don't have a total figure right now on how much it raised. Uh, the UTV, you took the vehicle that uh, sold tickets on, uh, was born at Harriet Point for the second time in four years. She donated it back to St. Hugh to be auctioned off. And it brought $8,500 in the auction to buy retail for $75. Thank you, Robert, and thanks to all who helped make it successful. Any other announcements or celebrations? Anything else anybody's feeling good about that you want the rest of us to know? I think we need to give Harriet a hand. Are you adequately embarrassed now, Harriet? I am. Uh, mission accomplished yeah. then, right? Okay. It says in Psalm 6, or Psalm 66, six, excuse me, let's start over again. Psalm 65 could be translated, silence is praise before you, O God. Let's begin our worship by worshiping God with our silence. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let us worship. If you are able, please stand with me for our call to worship. The Word of God is planted in our hearts. The love of God rains down on us. The breath of God blows softly within us. And so by the power of God's Spirit, we will worship in song. Please turn your hymnals to page 502. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. Jesus Christ. 
You may be seated. And we will turn our attention to our prayer of... Oh, well, congratulations. Ah! <laughs> All right. Another member. Thank you, Heather, for adding that celebration. All right. All right, very good. All right. With that happy news, we will turn our attention to our sins. <laughs> the... Uh, a vital part of living a spiritual life is self-examination and confession. And we do that each week as a community of faith in our unison prayer of confession. So if you care to, please join with me as we pray together in unison saying, Merciful God, you plant each of us like seeds in the same field, and together we are nourished and nurtured by the sun. We are blessed by the knowledge that you want us to grow towards what you call us to be. When we deprive others of that same opportunity, forgive us. When we want to uproot those whom we believe do not belong in our part of the field, forgive us. When we label others as good or bad, rather than accept them, forgive us. When we are reluctant to acknowledge that we ourselves are a mixture of weeds and wheat, forgive us. When we are afraid to look into the fields of our own lives, forgive us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And we continue with our silent and personal prayers of confession. <coughs> Because Jesus Christ is Lord of the harvest, all of our sins, misdeeds, failures, and mistakes are forgiven, and we can continue rejoicing in song. Please stand and turn your hymnals to page 511, The Solid Rock. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 3. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other
You may be seated. And we will turn our attention to our lectionary text for this 15th Sunday of Ordinary Time. Our psalm for the day is one section of Psalm 119. We remember that Psalm 119 is the great psalm that celebrates the Torah, or the teaching, or law of God. The psalm is divided is an acrostic. It's divided into sections, each one section for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The section that we are reading today, which begins with verse 105, is the noon section or N section. Every line begins with the letter N if it were in English. That's impossible to translate into another language, of course. But in Hebrew, every line begins with the N letter. Um, and as, as with the entire psalm, uh, in each, each line also incorporates a word. There are eight synonyms for Torah. Uh, law, statute, I can't name all eight of them, but there are eight synonyms. The English translations translate, and translate them in various ways, but every line, in one way or another, celebrates God's Word. That's the point. So, Psalm 119, 105 through 112, beginning with one of the most famous lines in the entire Bible. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to observe your righteous ordinances. There's a sense in which when we confess Jesus is Lord, we are taking an oath to do what Jesus says, to obey him. That is, in effect, what we are doing. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. I hold my life in my hand continually. That's vivid poetry there, a vivid description of being in danger. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your decrees are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes, not just outwardly, but inwardly, forever to the end. And then our Old Testament reading, continuing excerpts from Genesis, Genesis 25, beginning with verses 19, or not beginning with verse 19, through verse 34. In the Genesis saga, we have come to the birth of Jacob and Esau and the conflict between the two of them. So let's read the story here. These are the descendants of Isaac. Whenever, uh, several times, in whatever, well, I don't remember how many times, but in Genesis, this line indicates the beginning of a new section. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padam Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? I don't know if there are any women here who have been pregnant who wondered, why am I, why, why am I living if I have to endure this? Uh, uh, that's what she says. So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger which is not the way it's supposed to be in the ancient world, you understand. But God doesn't always respect human conventions, does he? When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, and so they named him Esau, which means red. Well, just like we have people in English, maybe might be called Red, either a nickname or sometimes even a given name. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob, which in Hebrew means supplanter, the one who takes the place of somebody else. 
So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. Well, Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Uh, seeds of marital and family conflict right there. Once, when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. And therefore he was called Edom, which also means red. The stew, the lentil stew, was reddish. So Jacob said, First, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die, which of course is a gross exaggeration. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright. Birthright is the eldest elder son, you see. Sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way, and thus Esau despised his birthright, selling it for a pot of bean soup. Then our uh, epistle reading is from Romans, continuing our excerpts from Romans in this summer of ordinary time. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Paul, thus far in Romans, has been demonstrating, first of all, that everyone, with or without the Bible, is in need of God's saving grace in Christ Jesus. And he has been explaining how that grace comes about. Uh, and in the previous chapter, chapter 7, talked about how uh, even as a Christian we continue to struggle with the evil impulses within us. And chapter 7 uh, uh, concluded, well, the, not to the last verse, but the previous verse, uh, Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, chapter 8, we begin the the uh, joyful culmination of this long theological discourse that Paul has been making. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, not according to human nature apart from the Spirit of God, not according to selfish human nature, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh, or according to the self, set their minds on the things of the self, or the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh, or the self, is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh, those who are self-centered, cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through His Spirit that dwells in you. And then our Gospel reading, continuing with Matthew. Matthew chapter 13, verses, first verses 1 through, nine, one through uh, 9, yes, and then we'll drop down to the explanation of this parable, which begins with verse um, 18. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. 
such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, or literally it says, the sower went out to sow, suggesting that there may have been on the accompanying hillside a farmer who was actually scattering, sowing. Remember, in ancient times, there were not mechanical planters. A grain was customarily planted by the farmer carried a bag or basket of grain, scooped it up with a hand and scattered it over the field, uh, the, uh, trying to aim for as even a distribution as possible, which of course is not humanly possible, but the more experienced the farmer, the more evenly sown it would be. So in any case, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path. The, beside the field, of course, there would be a path. And the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. And they sprang up quickly. Since they had no depth of soil, the soil would warm very quickly, and so the seeds would sprout. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them through thorns, thistles, weeds. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. And then verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but only endures for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Because of modern mechanical and chemical agriculture, there is much less wastage of seed as there was in before the Industrial Revolution. It used to be in the time of Jesus in first century Palestine, a farmer would recognize that a significant percentage of the seed he sowed would be wasted. It would never make it to harvest. Birds would eat it. But you know, there's an old, what's the old saying? Uh, planting a one for the cutworm, one for the crow, one for the what? And one to grow. Well, don't know that? I didn't grow up on a farm. Some of you are the ones who grew up on a farm. How can you not know? One, one for the cutworm, one for the crow, one for the blackbird, and one to grow. All right, there. That's the, that's the old, that's the way it was. Well, Jesus, in this wastage of seed, sees an analogy that often the gospel message, the word of the kingdom, as it's called in this text, often it is wasted. It doesn't accomplish anything. And that's really true not of, of any kind of truth, isn't it? Whether the truth be theological or philosophical or psychological or scientific or political or whatever the truth may be, some truth... Some words will always be wasted. They will fall on deaf ears, as we say. It will accomplish nothing. Any psychotherapist learns very quickly that unsolicited advice is usually useless. I suspect that may, when a, a, a psychotherapist gives advice, maybe 10, only 10% 10 of it is ever really followed. I know I'm not a psychotherapist, but I know I have learned it's really pointless 
to give advice, even when it's asked for more often than not, it's not going to be followed. As someone, a, friend of, a therapist friend of mine said once, you might as well save your breath for your soup. Save your breath for your soup. This is not going to accomplish anything. Uh, even Jesus spoke about don't throw pearls before swine, didn't he? It's pointless. Uh, pigs are not able to appreciate wisdom. In context, that's what he's talking about. They're not able to appreciate truth. You don't, don't throw your pearls before swine. And so this story identifies four categories or three categories on which the truth is wasted. One on which it's not wasted, but three on which it is simply wasted. Let's look at them. First, the word of truth is wasted on those who do not understand. It is wasted on those who do not understand. That's what Jesus says. That's the word he uses. They don't understand. This is the category I have thought about the most. It's the one that puzzles me the most. The gospel message is so simple. God loves us and through Christ forgives us and accepts us. What's so difficult about that? I mean, that's pretty simple, isn't it? It's pretty simple to state, pretty simple to understand. What is there to not understand? And yet, the fact is, there are many long-time professing Christians who do not understand the gospel. That concept is foreign to them. Why is that? William Barclay compares this to, do you know some people who just ne can never get a joke? Sharice will know someone in the family who uh, is famous for never getting a joke. It just, whatever it is, goes right over, right over her head. There are people like that, Barclay says, they can't get a joke. And he says, similarly, there are some people they just, they don't get it. No matter how simply you explain the gospel, they just are not going to get it. Um, some, well, another analogy would be poetry. There are people who just can't understand poetry. It just makes no sense to them. And so there are some people who just don't understand. Well, I have listed some reasons that I and others have thought of for not understanding. They're in no particular order, but here are some possible reasons why someone might un not understand. First of all, a lack of awareness of spiritual need. Some of us simply have no felt need. What do we need of the gospel? A friend called this an unfocused mind. He said that many people have unfocused minds. Uh, psychologists say that many of us, perhaps the majority of us, live unconscious, live unconsciously. We don't really, well, we don't, aren't really aware. We're just, we just kind of act on impulse, react to whatever the stimulus is at the time, and uh, live unconsciously. Uh, the father of Greek philosophy, Plato, famously said, the unexamined life is not worth living. And many of us have unexamined lives. I heard an interview once with a soldier who had been critically wounded, almost died in an IED, an uh, improvised explosive device. And in this interview, what I remember the one sentence that I particularly remember, he said, before I was injured, I never thought anything through. That's the way he put it. I never thought anything through. And I think there are many of us who live lives like that, are there not? We just don't think things through. We just kind of, whatever happens, happens, and we react to it however we react to it, and we don't think things through. There's many a recovering addict who would say, before I got into recovery, I just didn't think things through. So, some of us act on impulse, and we don't think things through, and so we don't understand. A second possible explanation for not understanding is what, in legal terms, is culpable ignorance. There is a, that's a legal, a legal category. Sometimes ignorance of the law is no excuse. You should have known. Not knowing you were breaking the law does not get you off the hook. You should have known. There is cul that's called culpable ignorance. It's willful ignorance. And so the attitude is, well, I don't want anything to interfere with my preconceptions. I don't want anything to challenge my prejudices or disrupt how I live my life. As the old saying goes, don't bother me with the facts. My mind is made up. 
So I don't want to hear it. Don't bother me. Well, and of course, uh, so there's a certain amount of arrogance in this attitude of culpable ignorance. I don't need to know. I don't want to know. Don't bother me with it. I'm quite happy with my life as it is. Father, or Dr. Father Phil, I know a Father Phil. Dr. Phil's a famous comment is apropos here. How's that working for you? Not wanting to know. Not thinking things through. How's that working for you? Is that working well? Then I asked some friends uh, their ideas on why uh, do people not understand. And here are some, they named a couple other things. One person said, because of addiction, which is so common in our society. Addiction of any kind, not necessarily substance abuse. But any kind of addiction distorts our thinking. As long as we are seriously addicted to something, we can't think things through. We will not understand. Our thinking will be distorted. Someone else pointed out that grace is not logical. That's why it's hard to understand. It defies common sense. Law, law good works, earning our place with God makes a lot more sense. Even the Apostle Paul identified this in Galatians 4, 3 and 9. He spoke of the Galatians once being enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world. And actually the word spirits is not there in the, in the Greek, original Greek. It's simply the elements. It's the word, by the way, that's used, uh, we use of elements in physics. That they were enslaved to the elements of the world or the elemental principles, as another translation puts it. uses the same word in Colossians 2, 8, and 20, the, uh, the elements by which the world lives. And in Colossians uh, 2, 20 in particular, he identifies what those elements are. Rules. Rules. That's the elementary way. The, the, way it's the, the elements, the way the world thinks, the way the world works is on this basic principle that success comes from achievement. That's the way, that's the elementary principle on which the world works. Success always comes from achievement. Therefore, that must be true of God as well. Success comes through achievement. So I've got to achieve. I've got to be good enough. I've got to do enough good things. My friend compared this to putting God in a box, which is a common practice. God is in a, must operate the way I, I think God should operate. That's God in a box. And that is a common form of thinking, is it not? God must do what I think God should do, which of course puts me in the place of God. I get to choose how God is going to act. That's God in a box. Last week, you remember, we looked at uh, chapter 11 of Matthew, verses 16 through 19, and we saw Jesus said that, you know, John came preaching a certain style, a stern message of repentance, living an ascetic life, and the religious leaders rejected him. I came eating and drinking, not living an ascetic life, preaching a message of grace and hope, and they rejected that too. And so he says, there are some, and the point being that there are some who simply will not hear because they don't want to hear. That's why he says in verse 9 in our text, the one who has ears to hear, let him hear. If you don't have an ear open to hearing, well, I really have nothing to say to you. It's pointless. So, the first, uh, the word of truth is wasted on those who do not understand. Secondly, it is wasted on those who want an easy way. The word of truth is wasted on those who want an easy way. These are the, this is the seed sown on shallow soil springs up quickly because the soil warms quickly, but there's no subterranean moisture to sustain it. And he says, when trouble or persecution comes, they quickly fall away. Last week, we, I, we commented on um, how many of us expect a problem-free life. We have this notion that life should be free of problems. And it is because of this great spiritual distress when it happens. I remember uh, when I was a hospice chaplain, one of the nurses talking about a woman 
in her late 80s who was a hospice patient, meaning she was terminally ill, and the woman said to, her, to the nurse, I never thought it would be this way. And the nurse wanted to say, she did not say, but she wanted to say, well, how did you think it would be? Everybody dies, you know. Why did you think you were exempt? Where did you get off thinking that? Oh, well, she didn't say that, of course, but it's what she wanted to say. Uh, a psychotherapist friend of mine told me once about a young boy that he counseled. The boy had gone forward in a revival meeting, confessed Christ was baptized because the preacher said, if you accept Jesus, nobody will ever hurt you again. So he accepted Jesus, and the next day, the bullies at school beat him up the same way they had done every day before, which produces a spiritual crisis. The fact is, the preacher lied to him. If you accept Jesus, nobody will ever hurt you again. That sure isn't what Jesus said, is it? And so he was in a... Uh, there was a woman... I've told this story before, who was diagnosed with, she had, was a faithful churchgoer, and she was diagnosed with cancer. Her priest came to visit her, and she wouldn't let him in. Never darkened the door of the church again, because God had failed. She was supposed, because she was faithfully went to church, God was supposed to protect her from anything bad happening. That's the bargain. Right? That's the way it's supposed to be, and it didn't work that way. The health and wealth gospel that is so popular in America in these days sets many people up for disappointment and for failure. You know, we've all heard the, in re religious censuses or surveys anymore, there are the nuns, the growing number of people not associated with any religious belief. Well, there are also a, a significant portion of the nuns are duns. I'm done with religion. I've tried it. It didn't work. Usually, that means somebody was sold a bill of goods. Simplistic promises like, if you uh, accept Jesus, nobody will ever hurt you again. Simplistic promises that do not work, and that leads to people being done. This category describes what Gallup would call the duns. Those who are done with religion. Tried it, didn't work, want, no more, no, want nothing more to do with it. And then the third category is the word of truth wasted on those preoccupied with other things. Those preoccupied with other things. This is the seed that falls among thorns or thistles or weeds that, that chokes it up. And the text says these weeds represent the cares of the world and the lure of wealth. There are lots of things to worry about, aren't there? I'm worried about the practicalities of daily survival. I just want to get through today. Why should I care about theology or any other kind of truth? I've got other things to worry about, more pressing things to worry about, or I'm, I'm busy trying to earn a living. Don't bother me. I don't have time for religion. I'm trying to earn a living. Don't bother me with all this stuff. I'm busy. Keith Miller, in one of his books, tells about a woman who was challenged to try an experiment. Devote one day to God. To say to God, God, you can have this day. Just do with it what you want. Let me know what you want me to do. And try reluctantly. What her, her objection to religion was she was busy. I don't have... To her... Becoming a Christian just means adding one more thing to the to-do list. One more thing to worry about. That's what it meant to her. More things to do. And she was already had too much to do. And so she agreed to this experiment, give a day to God. She woke up that morning with a cold. Spent the day in bed, resting. She thought becoming a Christian would mean having so much more to do. I remember last week, was it last week we heard Jesus say, Come to me, all you who are heavy, beaten, and burdened, and I will give you rest. What she needed was rest. And she spent the day resting. During Holy Week, I attended their Holy Week services, uh, community services in Huntsville. Half hour service. Message was only 10 minutes or less. Okay? It's a little sermonette, a little devotional talk. 
and what, during one of those, uh, someone's, uh, actually I know he's a hospice chaplain, actually I know who he is, I know him, his phone went off during the message. He had not turned it off, did not put it on vibrate, it went off. So he got up and answered it, walking out of the circle, walking to the back, you could still hear him talking in the back. And I was, I was so annoyed. I thought there is, there is nothing, there is no message that can't wait five minutes. Five minutes would have made no difference whatsoever, but he could not wait. He could not turn off his phone. He had to get that message, whatever it was. It, he could not wait five minutes. He was preoccupied. So whatever the message was that day, in fact, I don't know what the message was because I was so distracted and angry, I could never get back in tune with the, uh, actually it was uh, Christy Ashton who was speaking that day. I could never get back in tune with what she was saying because I was too angry with the, with the guy. But that's a classic illustration. Whatever the message was, it was wasted on him because he was preoccupied with other things. Whatever that message was on his phone, whatever that person was that that person wanted, that was more important than whatever the message was. So the word of truth is wasted on those preoccupied with other things. But the word of truth is not always wasted. There is the unwasted word as well as the wasted word. And that's really the main point of the story. We tend, to, and in this sermon certainly, I have emphasized the negative, but I don't think that's the main point Jesus was making. The main point is to encouragement in the face of discouragement, even though there are people on whom the word is wasted, it is not wasted on everybody. Some will respond, some will hear, some will understand, some will act, some lives will be changed. Some seed will produce fruit, he says. And that word fruit simply means changed lives. In Matthew 3, 8, John the Baptist says to, the, to the, those listening to him, bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Let me see some action that will show you have really changed. Show me. Show me some action that will show you have changed. In Matthew 7, 20, Jesus says, of their, that by their, speaking of false prophets, by their fruit you will know them. By the way they act, by their behavior. Do their lives change? Do they change other people's lives? In John 15, 8, fruit is uh, described as becoming disciples of Jesus. That's to bear fruit. To be a disciple, of course, is to learn and to follow the teaching and example of Jesus. Or another way to think of the fruit is Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Some seed will produce that kind of fruit, Jesus says. Don't be discouraged. The key to the word not being wasted is hearing. Hearing and reflecting, which is a difference. We can hear something, and we all do that. Maybe we hear a weather forecast on the television or the radio. In ten, I, I've done this, and 10 minutes later, I don't know what I heard. What was the forecast for tomorrow? I heard it. But you, I see a lot of heads nodding. I'm not the only one who does this, right? We can hear and not hear. We all, we all do that. It's part of normal life. So the key is hearing and reflecting. How does this speak to my life circumstances? And it's acting. What do I do because of this passage? That's always the bottom line. What do I do? And so the lesson that Jesus wants to get us to get out of this story is to keep on living and speaking the word of truth, the word of the kingdom, the gospel of grace, because some will hear, some will respond, some will change. William Barclay tells a moving story but an old man, he was called Old Thomas, lived in some small town in England. 
he had outlived all of his family and friends, and he died. Someone who knew him figured he was going to be just a simple burial service when he was interred. No, no full-fledged funeral or anything like that. Someone who knew him figured nobody else, nobody's going to go to this service. Nobody but the priest. So I, I, uh, I'll go. So there'll be, at least be somebody there at the burial service besides the priest. So he goes, accompanies the coffin to the cemetery. It is a windy, rainy, miserable day. But waiting for them at the cemetery is a soldier. He has a raincoat on. Can't tell his insignia. But he's waiting there. Accompanies them then to the gravesite. The priest does the burial service. As the body is lowered into the ground, the soldier snaps to attention and salutes until the burial is completed. When it was done, he and the soldier, the only two people at this burial ceremony, other than the priest, and well then obviously the grave attendants, walk away together. And as they're walking, the, soldier, the wind blows open the soldier's raincoat and he sees this guy is a general, full-fledged general. And the soldier says to the other fellow, you probably are wondering why I'm here. When I was a boy, Thomas was my Sunday school teacher. I was wild and unruly and I made his life miserable. But he stuck with me. And he made me what I am. Everything I am, everything I have done, I owe to old Thomas. And so I had to come and salute him at the end. The lesson, of course, is that we never know what influence we may have on somebody else. And it may seem that we have no influence whatsoever. And we may never know how our words change somebody's life. The secondary lesson, of course, is don't wait till if, if somebody has influenced us, if somebody has changed our lives, don't wait till they're dead to salute them, right? Don't wait till they're dead. But the larger lesson is we never know how our words may affect somebody else. The point that Jesus makes is that the word is never really wasted. Despite how it may appear, despite the number who don't understand, despite the number who are shallow, despite the number who are preoccupied with other things, the word is never really wasted. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me as we prepare to recite the Apostles' Creed? If you need to look at it, it's printed on the inside back flyleaf of our hymnal. We do this to remind ourselves, first of all, of what we believe, because some of us are professional forgetters. And we do it, secondly, to bear witness to what we believe. So, if you will, if you care to, join with me as we recite together this ancient creed saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead and descended into heaven. There he sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And we will turn our attention to our prayer concerns. We always pray for those who attend AA meetings here. We pray for our North Alabama Presbytery, our Mission of the Month, which is the Presbyterian Children's Home. We've been praying for persecuted Christians, for those incarcerated and their families, and for all of those who are in any way affected by the opiate epidemic in our country. Cancer patients, Bev, Robert Eugene, Joe Ray, Kathy, J.D. Munch, uh, Amy Wright, and Donna Kay. I spoke with Donna Kay this week. She is still has two more weeks, two or three more weeks of radiation treatment left. 
she says that um, she's, it, it's not affecting her as much as the chemotherapy. She's tired, and she says she feels like she has a sunburn, uh, but it's not as bad as the chemotherapy, so she all things considered she's doing well. Any updates on anyone else whom I just named? Any other cancer patients? Uh, Tom's son, uh, Bob, and daughter, Joellen. Any news on Joellen? She's doing okay, all right. And then uh, Carol Kadick, his uh, back is really bothering her this morning. So this potentially serious, Frank? All right, well, we'll pray for Carol. Linda is on her way back. Linda Belstein is on her way back from Dallas and her Stephen Ministry Leadership Training. I presume she is very excited, and she will be giving us a report on that, and we'll be commissioning her uh, later. But uh, we'll pray, for, continue to pray for her and Stephen Ministry and pray for her travel safety. Julie Bowling is not feeling well today. She is not here, so we'll pray for her. The Davenport children, these are two children. Um, twins, right? With uh, serious genetic problems requiring very expensive medication, and we've been praying for them for some time. Valerie um, is uh, not all, so many Sundays not able to be here because her MS is acting up. We'll pray for her. Uh, Bobby Jordan, notice in the worship folder she has moved into uh, uh, to the Florence Nursing and Rehabilitation Center. She would welcome your visits, I am told. So feel free to go by and visit her. Uh, I doubt that she has a phone in her room, but has anybody been by to see her in the new place? I doubt that she has a phone, but uh, you're, she would welcome your coming by to visit. Amy Gravely is still wearing her boot. She is making progress, but still in need of healing. Frank, uh, Scott, who are you? You're Scott. Your father is Frank, yes. Um, Scott's father is still, uh, what shall we say, struggling? Uh, he's he's a little better All right. All right, we'll continue praying for him. Uh, Joyce, Ann, and Kitty, we will pray for. Harriet's uh, uncle and aunt, Mike and Patsy Sparks, continue. They're better, all right? We'll pray for them. Uh, Patsy is still having pain. The pain is getting better, which means, well, actually, that we have to say, it's the pain is getting less. <laughs> right. You're better, the pain isn't better, yeah. yeah. Uh, Amy Walport and Trish Montgomery, Trish Montgomery COPD, we prayed for last week. Uh, Amy Walport, I don't remember who asked, pardon? Cancer, okay, she belongs up in the cancer list then, all right. Any, anyone else that should be added to this list? We'll pray in our usual manner, a few moments for silent prayer so that each of us can pray about any unspoken needs we may have. Then I will name these, group these together, name them aloud, and together we will say, Lord, have mercy. Then I will lead us in prayer, and we'll conclude our prayer time with the Lord's Prayer. Let's bow for a few moments of silent prayer. Together we pray for those who attend AA meetings here, for our North Alabama Presbytery, for the Presbyterian Children's Home, and for all persecuted Christians. Together we pray for the incarcerated and for their families, and for all of those involved in dealing with the opiate epidemic. We pray for cancer patients, Bev, Robert Eugene, Joe Ray, Kathy, JD, Donna Kay, uh, Amy and Amy. Together we pray for uh, Bob and Joellen and for Carol and for Linda and her Stephen ministry. Together we pray for Julie, for the Davenport children, for Valerie and for Bobby. We pray for Amy and Frank and Joyce, uh, Joyce Ann and Kitty and for Mike and Patsy Sparks, and for uh, Patsy Jordan, and for Amy and for Trish. Father, thank you that we can entrust you all these for whom we care, or people for whom we want to care. We confess that 
it's hard praying for people we don't know. It's hard to feel compassion for people whom we do not know. We ask that you would make up for our lack of compassion with your all-sufficient compassion and with your grace and with your love, so we entrust your loving care. Those for whom we care, those for whom we would like to care, and those for whom we pray. We entrust your loving care, all of us in this room, our lives, our futures, all of the challenges that we may face in the year ahead in the, in the, and in the week ahead. We entrust to you as we pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue our worship now by receiving our tithes and offerings. stand for the doxology. trust these gifts to our Father's keeping and guidance, and we bring our worship to a conclusion with... Uh, page 509. My faith looks up to thee. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
give the word of grace such success in us that our lives will bring glory to the Father and to the Son and to the one who reigns with them in highest heaven, one God reigning forever and ever. Amen.